So hi, welcome to End Credit Reviews on episode after the credits on End Credit Reviews. This is Tyler this time from End Credit Reviews. And Stephen from Stephen Lawson Studios. Yes, and today we are going to be talking about at least my personal top 10 Christopher Nolan movies. Now the thing is that... Christopher Nolan is one of my personal favorite directors, at least working right now, mainly because he consistently keeps making good movies, and also many of his movies, the strong majority of them, are original movies, so he's keeping originality alive in Hollywood. And at the same time, I do think because of the fact that Tenant is going to be his 11th full fe feature-length movie, I thought it'd be a perfect time to talk about the 10 movies that are currently released right now and rank them from worst to best. So at least from my least favorite to my most favorite, and I'm going to have Steven chime in with it. So here it goes. This is my pick. And then, you know, again, Steven was just going to say his thoughts on it. But Yeah, I, I was actually going to say maybe we could uh, bounce back and forth and say like your 10, my 10, 9, 9, 8, 8, that sort of thing. Yeah, or maybe where you rank this one, in a way. But you know when you're... But I, I know I have my list memorized. Yeah, I've got mine, too. All right, good. Down, so. <laughs> or at least maybe when I say whatever mine is, maybe you could say what number that's at. Sure. All right, so at number 10, I think many people agree with this, is the movie Following. Following was Christopher Nolan's first feature-length movie, and it's about a guy who tends to follow people just for the fun of it, but then he runs into a guy who actually figures out he's being followed, and the guy happens to be a thief, and things escalate from there. And for me, this is kind of like Nolan's Fear and Desire, which was Stanley Kubrick's first feature-length movie, and many would agree that's their weakest movies, but at the same time, you can see what they're trying to go for and later stuff they would perfect later down the road in their movies. And this one, too, one thing I do like about it is that it does foreshadow Christopher Nolan's um, career later down the road because when they break into one of the apartments, there is a Batman sticker in one of the doors. <laughs> yep. All the way in back in 1998, folks. True, very true. Um, no, I, I completely agree with you. On, um, it, it turned out there was two movies I hadn't seen um, of Nolan's recently, and this was one of the ones I made sure to watch. Uh, preparing for this and I am in complete agreement like there are elements of Nolan's intelligent writing and understanding of characters and themes um, but obviously being as low budget as it was and kind of a generally pretty simple concept um, and his first work it definitely comes across as um, you know solid but indie quality you know it's not to say that indie is a bad thing but limited in scope as composed to pretty much all of his other films um so i definitely am in agreement with tyler that this is number 10 okay so at number nine my list is going to be pretty controversial but for me it just um it's my opinion just keep that in mind yeah. and that would be the movie memento so memento is a movie about Guy Pierce's character has memory loss. He's kind of like Dory from the Finding Nemo movies before that was a thing. So I don't know, maybe Pixar plagiarized that. Who knows? <laughs> and the thing was that um, he's trying to figure out this mystery. And this one, I think, is Nolan's one movie that I think is kind of overrated. I definitely would never, never in a million years think this is a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination. For me, it just felt like the way the sto it went without story... Well, actually, the way it went with the story, especially the ending of the movie with its final reveal, felt a little bit disjointed, and I just felt a little bit lost at the end. At least that was just my opinion, at least my experience with it. So I'll let you take it from here, Stephen. Sure. Um, yeah, I definitely have a difference of opinion here. Um, my ranking for Memento is a bit higher on the list. I can, I guess I can give the number when we get to said number. Um, but... Memento was definitely, to me, um, one of the main points at which he early on showed he is a director with some chops that can provide something different and shake up not only Hollywood, but how um, film storytelling can be done for mainstream audiences. And that's not to say that everyone saw this film, but, you know, he got a lot of credit for it. And even some of your 
part-timer film lovers will know what Memento is, which shows that it has gotten some recognition. Um, I, my personal number nine, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this well, at some Well, I point. was actually, um, want to say that, you know, when I, well, the, the thing was that I was saying how if I mentioned movie, you would say what number this is on your list. Oh, okay. Well, that's going to be weird bouncing all over the place. But um, I guess for me, Memento would be probably fourth. Okay. All right. So anyway, at number eight on my list is a movie I think is slightly better than Memento is Insomnia. So Insomnia is a movie about... um, I just forgot his name for the brief moment. Sorry about that. It is uh, Al Pacino was a detective who was searching for a killer in Alaska, and I think it's a pretty interesting noir crime movie where it definitely showed to Warner Brothers that, hey, this guy could possibly make a Batman movie down the road. And also it was kind of surprising to see Robin Williams as the villain of the movie, and I think it works pretty well. It just shows how he has a lot of variety, he had a lot of variety as an actor, and he was a very talented one. And I know a lot of people... Um, thought some people thought that Hilary Swank's character was kind of annoying, but I actually thought she was pretty good in the movie, and I think she is interacting capabilities in this movie is better than some of the other actresses later that were in the Batman movies by Nolan later down the road. But Steve and I are going to cover that later. But mm. what did you think of this one, Stephen? This is actually my number eight. Um, I am not. It was fine in the Nolan. Um, you know, archive of his films that he's made, but I was not nuts about it, similarly to um, following. Um, There honestly isn't any film that I can say of Nolan's that I found was, you know, bad, but Mm -hmm. this was definitely more towards the end of like, okay, this is more run-of-the-mill, what, you know, you just see pumped out every year as, you know, something for our boomer grandparents to go see a you know cop uh generic cop film and um you know i i agree that robin williams was um an interesting choice for this as the villain um but to me it just it, it was okay it wasn't remarkable it was fine for what it was Okay, I get that. Um, So anyway, at number seven on my list would be the movie Interstellar. Now, Interstellar, I think, is a pretty good movie. I mean, it can be a bit taxing when it comes to its length. And at the end, it does get a bit kind of bizarre and kind of a little bit odd, in my opinion. Like, it felt like it didn't know where to end, I think, personally. And I know some people have been vocal about how much they... Where if he about this movie, I had a teacher once back in my community college years that briefly mentioned, yeah, I didn't really care for that Interstellar movie. And she was the one I was telling you about, Stephen, how mm-hmm. she was a bit unprofessional. She would like interrupt when someone was trying to make a point and brought her own personal baggage into it. But right. I did like uh, Matthew McConaughey in this movie, and I was surprised how much I liked Anne Hathaway, too, mm-hmm. in as well. I thought it was kind of weird, that whole like robot, how it moved in that sort of deal, mm-hmm. but it looked very realistic, and I remember the surprise celebrity cameo was Matt Damon, and I remember reading in a comment section that he said, when I went to go see this movie, when it was revealed Matt Damon was a surprise celebrity cameo, someone in the audience said, Matt Damon, <laughs> and everyone erupted into laughter <laughs> with it, and I think it's safe to say that this movie is kind of our generation's 2001 a Space Odyssey. In a way, it connects. Although I do like 2001 Space Odyssey better, I will say one thing I like more about this movie than that one is that there's more of an emotional connection with our main character. We do get an establishment in 2001 Space Odyssey that the main character does have a family of sorts. However, in this one, they do remind that more, so we do care more for our protagonist on a more, at least an emotional level. But, And again, the movie, nice escapism from time to time, and... So I'll let you uh, take it from here, Stephen. Sure, yeah. Um, Interstellar, for me, was towards the middle, but lower middle. So I put it as number six on the list. I definitely liked it where it was going um, for the first act of the film and even into the second. But once it got to the third and started turning into this weird, esoteric 
uh, oh, just, you know, you can look into the past of your own life because, you know, of different dimensional properties. And it's like, oh, this is just getting to, like, the point of pretentiousness that I cannot stand in movies. Like, you know, they, they, um, they're too afraid to put something about space or um, a, a subject we don't understand and just go balls in all the way on it. So what do they do? They kind of flake out and go into some weird, esoteric, generalized theme um, that doesn't make a lot of sense, especially if you are trying to apply it to the rest of the narrative. And to me, that made Interstellar ultimately, towards the end, just turn into this, eh, you know, like, okay thing that could have been a lot more than it was. And comparing it to 2001 A Space Odyssey, I can see that, but in this case, that's a bit of an insult to 2001, because I think it's it did it a bit cleaner. Um, and if anything, I would say, that not that Nolan did this, I think that there's validity to Nolan being kind of a Kubrick-esque respected um, after a long time doing films sort of director. Um, but I feel that, if anything, Annihilation is probably what I would say is the 2001 of our generation. We'll see if there's something that can beat that back, um, you know, and do a better job than that. But that, to me, encapsulated it more than Interstellar did because of the failed landing. Yeah, I get you. I mean, I will say um, Annihilation, at least in my opinion, was the exact opposite, where the first two thirds were kind of okay for me, but then the third act was like, whoa, mm -hmm. it got really excellent, especially the music was amazing. I love that part. Yep. And yeah, I do think that it kind of felt like a new, another director kind of hijacked the movie. Sure. When it got, it kind of became like a pretentious Tree of Life movie. Mm, I, I get you. Again, talking about 2001, you can argue that some of that quote-unquote pretentious element is inevitable, but it, it, I guess it comes down somewhat to preference. Yeah, I feel like if you just sprinkle it out evenly, it's fine, but when you kind of cluster it up, it becomes too much. <laughs> sure, I get that. Yeah, um, one last thing I wanted to mention too is that um, some of the actors who played the you know the children, like when they're adults, it was uh, Topher Grace and Jessica Chastain, but when they're kids and that sort of thing, they're played by, um, let's see, Mackenzie Foy and Timothy Kemlet, who you, who's who gone on to be in the late other stuff, too. Remember the whole meme about, um, you know, main character saying, Murph! Murph. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, my son. Yeah, you you exist, but Murph! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, starts crying over it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, so the actor um, who plays the son in the movie... Um, Timothy with, with two E's. <laughs> um, I don't know how you pronounce that her last name, Chamlet, or something. Whatever. <laughs> I'm yeah. not very good with names here. <laughs> so he was uh, on the downside. He probably was like didn't really mention his son. Like, oh yeah, you're gonna be in that uh pro pedo movie called Calling Me by Your Name. <laughs> <laughs> but he was in this really good movie called The King that was on Netflix. I mean, I like that. that. Yeah. I like it, but I like that movie despite the historical inaccuracies, at least from sure. my peers over at college in the history department. They're like, yeah, we, there's a lot of historical inaccuracies. But I'm like, it was enjoyable at least. And I did like um, Robert Patterson's like French accent. <laughs> it was, was it? it was like big balls, but uh, teeny cook. Teeny cook. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh, great. and the the other actress, um, Mackenzie Foy, has had a pretty uh, mixed filmography. Mm -hmm. This is a good movie, and Ernest Ke Ernest and Kelstein is a pretty good animated movie, kind of like Zootopia, but came out before Zootopia did, at least by a few years. It was a French animated movie, mm -hmm. and the lower half of IMDb is being the last Twilight movie as the kid. Yikes. <laughs> Big yikes. And then in that uh, hot mess of a movie called The Nutcracker in the Four Realms Ooh. that I mentioned. Ooh, Remember that video rough. I made? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, overall, I would say at least she grew up to be cute. She did, though. Wow. Yes. We're seeing a picture right now. <laughs> Just for context, so it's... 
Not like I'm just being weird spontaneously. <laughs> I'll just show it on the screen for a bit and that sort of thing. Wow, wow, we, why yes? It's not going to be awkward like um, <laughs> that guy from Middle Media, what's his name? Mike, I think it is. Yeah. Who's talking about how much he likes Kirsten Dunst? Right, and I'm not gonna really say it, <laughs> repeat it. Yeah, is it, he's the one that goes like this? He yeah. talks the whole yeah, the Mr. Time Plinkett like voice. This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, anyways, so moving on to number six is The Dark Knight Rises. So, The Dark Knight Rises, in my opinion, is Nolan's weakest movie in the Batman trilogy. And I do think it's a pretty good movie. I did like uh, Tom Hardy as Bane, despite the fact of his voice being kind of just a little bit weird for me. And I didn't like how Batman, not once but twice, but has to pick himself back up. I felt like that was a little bit redundant. The pacing could have been better. They could have explained how Bruce Wayne got back to Gotham City. I also felt like um, Catwoman's assistant in the movie was pretty pointless and easily could have been cut from the movie, which I know is a reference to Batman Year One. And I did like... um, Anne Hathaway's Catwoman, but I didn't like how she's a little bit snarky a bit in the voice, and I just realized this in recent years, but she didn't have a whip, which I was kind of surprised that they didn't have that part, Mm -hmm. which is iconic for that character. And then also, when I was mentioning earlier about actresses later down the road in the Batman movies not being the best of actresses, would be uh, (laughs) Marianne Cotillard's acting. Oh boy, yep. Yeah, remember the, I don't know if you've seen this, but I gotta show you it, but there is a video where she's speaking in French, where she's been interviewed for a movie called Allied, and she's brought up about her, what do you think about your criticisms about your death scene in The Dark Knight Rises, and she's a little, a little bit awkward, and then they cut to a video where this guy's doing a diss rap, he does it for different celebrities, and he basically said, like, your last good movie was Taxi, you're, you know, that was worse than your death scene in Batman. <laughs> that is pretty okay. funny. Yeah, she, she it, that's, uh, Pretty pretty accurate. Uh, I I definitely am in a bit um, of disagreement. I think. Uh, let me see. What was the place I put this one? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess for me, this was either fourth or fifth. I can't remember if I said Memento was fourth, but um, b- basically it is. Either fourth or fifth. I think it's fifth specifically. I will stop rambling. The point is, I do find it, similarly to Tyler, narrowly to be a bit weaker than Batman Begins upon re-seeing them. Um, I I definitely prefer Bane a bit, um, at least initially, to how Ra's al Ghul ended up. But... Um, so much about Batman in the uh, first film, Batman Begins, um, kind of just didn't fly as well, especially in this second and third acts of The Dark Knight Rises, which definitely did make it a little bit weaker of a landing to me. Um, And I know we were talking about kind of like the um, social political climate of which this was made a bit, and we don't need to talk about that a whole lot, but, you know, you were mentioning this was made, you know, under a different president president in a different time as opposed to the other two, and I think that's pretty valid, that it kind of, um, it, that did show in some of the, um, you know, class struggle narrative, which was a bit more elevated this time, um, and ultimately it just comes down to it's a tragedy that, um, Heath Ledger had to die because there there were completely different plans and then they settled for, okay, we'll do a mirrored Batman Begins with, you know, basically Batman not being the young guy anymore, the old guy, um, and having to root his way back to the top one last time. And um, I, I agree with you, Catwoman was a strong performance, but how Bane was ultimately dealt with was dumb, and um, the death of, I can't even, uh, Talia's, uh, Talia's death was um, pretty dumb, how they had to have a last speech, and so she's just like, oh right, I have to die now. (laughs) (laughs) But um, I will say that the very ending, with sending it off on Robin, 
that was solid. I, I, I do think that despite that little bit of <laughs> material <laughs> towards the very end, yeah. um, how they left it kind of felt like a solid end to what Nolan had made. Yeah, and on top of that, it kind of did plagiarize the ending of the Iron Giant with the main character sacrificing himself with a nuclear missile this is or true. bomb of some kind, and then the people build a statue for him, and then it turns out he's alive at the end. <laughs> yes. T- Tyler and the Iron Giant, absolutely. One of my all-time favorite movies. Yep. Yep. And uh, Vin Diesel, you can understand him better when he's voice acting than he does in live-action movies. Unironically, that's his best performance, yes. The- hands down. And Groot. In the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Sure. Um, I, I would still say Iron Giant is better. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has more charisma in just in being an anime and robot with less than 100 lines of dialogue than the yep. entire Fast and Furious franchise. <laughs> <laughs> Not that that was hard in the first place, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so at number five on my list is Dunkirk. Now, Dunkirk is based on a true story of the evacuation of Dunkirk as the Allied powers were trying to evacuate the military members and citizens from the imposing forces of Nazi Germany. And I think it's a pretty solid movie. I did like the tension of time. I like how in Hans Zimmer's soundtrack you do hear like a ticking, you know, like clock, like, you know, seconds and how like time is so valuable at the moment. And I love this shot, too, when they're all looking upwards and that sort of deal. Mm-hmm. And I remember there was a dumb controversy about, like, oh, why, how, where is all the representation, even though it's based off history? Right. Look it up, people. And then I remember someone posted on, like, um, social media and some mainstream media site. And then when it got some heat, they retracted it. And I did like how in the movie, too, how um, Tom Hardy is wearing a mask like Bane. Yeah. And that sort of thing, ironically. But I did like how when they showed the enemy in the movie, although I did do think that the movie kind of begins a bit too abrupt, I think. At least in my opinion, the beginning was a little bit too rushed. But mm. I did like how when they showed the enemy, the Nazi Germans, how they're kind of in the distance, like it's kind of an unseen enemy, which I think is, you know, kind of cool mm-hmm. in that. And also there's some other big name actors in it, like Kenneth Brana, pretty good performance, even though this photo right here that I'm showing is kind of like his reaction of seeing everyone's thoughts on his new movie, Artemis Fall. <laughs> I still haven't seen it, but I'm, I'm not expecting good results. I'm obligated from family members, uh, but I'm have not a lot looking of, forward to it. Have a lot of uh, caffeine with you because you might fall asleep. I almost did watching what? this movie. I will note that. All right, so uh, your take on Dunkirk. Dunkirk is going to be my spicy one for you, I think. Okay. It's my number nine. Okay. I, I was not a huge fan of it. Um, I, I saw what it was trying to go for, and I acknowledge that it was fairly well executed, um, at, at least technically for um, you know the setting and various things like that. But to me, it could be summarized very simply as um, war memento done wrong in war that that is ultimately what I felt of it and um, while it does feature some you know great cinematography in IMAX and um, some scenes that Nolan is just you know known for and I, I will give him credit it was kind of a departure from a lot of his other previous works this was military-esque, which he hadn't really delved in aside from Batman and his gadgets on the street with police, really. Um, But to me, it felt pretty bland um, compared to his other films. And honestly, that may just be because he was dealing with real people (laughs) Um, as as opposed to um, characters of which he creates. But um, to me, this was definitely towards the tail end, not the tail end, that's following for me. Um, But definitely this was a film that felt like it dragged and it didn't accomplish for me, um, and I'm sure there are other people that would probably feel similarly, um, the sort of disjointed narrative of time um, that Memento accomplished more effectively but, you know, it, it ultimately felt to me like, what is the point aside from 
inducing a sort of um, uncertainty in the audience, which, to be fair, that could be the only reason it was there. But I think Nolan is a bit more complicated than that, and I haven't actually listened to an interview on his justification for it. But to me, it definitely is towards the tail end. Okay. So at number four on my list is, in my opinion, Nolan's most underrated movie, at least one of his more underrated movies, is The Prestige. The Prestige was sandwiched in between his two Batman movies, and it's about these two magicians, illusionists, whatever you want to call them, are pretty much trying to one-up each other throughout it, and I really like this one a good amount. It's really good. I think the performances by both Hugh Jackman and Christian Bale are really excellent in this movie and I like how the movie is not very predictable you don't really know exactly well it's not predictable like you can tell where it's going to go and I do like it when it's in a script where it keeps you guessing which I do like about it I mean I do like some predictability like in narrative structure but when it comes to like twists and turns that's a good thing and also I felt like it was kind of odd seeing David Bowie cast as like Nikolai Tesla I mm-hmm. believed and I did like how they tied it in with that in a way and also I keep a lot of people keep forgetting that Scarlett Johansson was in this movie and it's kind of funny seeing uh, Batman and Wolverine and Black Widow all in this movie absolutely no that that is true and David Bowie on top of it, just like, yeah, I'm the musicians here too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just talking about comic book here. Oh, no, I, I understand. That. But yeah, this is a really good movie, I think. So uh, your thoughts, Stephen? Mm-hmm. Um, for the ranking of it, I actually put this at number six. So it just barely didn't make the top five for me. But um, I, I agree with Tyler. It is definitely one of his stronger, um, not affiliated to any sort of other property, you know. This is definitely one that um, has been overshadowed by other films, but accomplished what it wanted to very effectively, was very competently told and sold to the audience in a way um, that was very clever. And honestly, I'm convinced that, if anything, one of the reasons that um, Christopher Nolan was chosen for this film, although I admit I... And blanking on the year of which this was released. 2006, I believe. 2006. So that was the year of Batman Begins? Well, that was 2005. Okay. Well, then my timeline's a little bit off. But um, I, I was thinking that um, the this film really shows a similar flair um, to his style of Batman in emphasizing the, um, the illusion aspect and subverting the audience's expectations literally in the seats, you know, so it's kind of a meta movie as well. Um, and so th- this was definitely a fun one. I still remember I liked um, both Jackman and um, Bale in-, in this film quite a bit, but um, it definitely is sixth on the list for a reason because... You know, it's contained in scale to some of his larger works. Um, that makes it, you know, still great in its own right, but I tend to prefer a couple exceptions over this one. Okay, so at number three on my list is going to be the most uh, controversial one, I think, at least mm-hmm. with Steven, is The Dark Knight. I think this is a great movie. It's definitely one of the best Batman movies and comic book movies ever made a very important movie. It's a shame that the Oscars decided not to nominate for Best Picture, but nominated a bunch of of other dumb movies that no one's talking about anymore, Mm. despite it being nominated for a bunch of other categories. First comic book movie to win Oscar for an acting category, which was Heath Ledger as the Joker. But also, I really love a lot of these cinematography shots in the movie, how, again, we see in the movie the the fact of like you know terrorism with the joker and also with batman how he it really does push him to the limit when it comes to how far he'll go to take this guy down who pretty much has no limits as the joker said it's like uh when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object and i I do love um a lot of things this movie i think the first shot the, the first scene of the movie is just perfection it's one of the few like first scenes in the movie they think is just perfect everything about it mm-hmm. i will say a few criticisms criticisms of this movie i have well slightly i wish the joker would have had his you know joker toxin you know joker gas because you know scarecrow has his fear gas i'm just wondering how come he didn't have his 
And also, I um, thought the ending where he kind of said, blame it on me, I felt like that kind of felt a bit like forced drama, at least in my opinion. And then finally, I think um, casting uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal to replace, um, I just forgot her name. Um, Rachel Dawes. No, I mean, that's that's the character. I'm talking about the actress. Katie um, Holmes. Katie, Katie Holmes, yeah. yeah. Um, and I heard it was because either she was pregnant and couldn't do it, or she'd rather be in this movie called Mad Money. I don't know which one. Fail. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's just that because she was a different actress than that, that's why I didn't really feel that sad when she died mm -hmm. in the movie. But anyway, uh, I'll let you know. I want to know your thoughts, even, yeah. on Dark Knight. This will probably be the longest one I go off on. Go off, King. Um, <laughs> so this, for me, hands down... It, wish it could have been drawn out the suspension a bit more but this is by far my number one for nolan um and i don't think that's a surprise i think for a lot of people it is their number one and for me it, it is for a very special reason um obviously the joker is a huge part of it obviously um the performances throughout it are just all pretty spectacular overall there may be one in the background somewhere that I'm forgetting, you know, that was like, you know, all he was in was in Wendy's commercials after this. But, you know, like, <laughs> in in general, it was, you know, fantastic for um, pretty much everyone in the film. I do agree with Tyler that um, Maggie Gyllenhaal was not as good. Um, although, <laughs> this is, sounds so dark, but... It felt better to see her get blown up than <laughs> the hottie, um, you know. And um, it, it something that was pretty funny was, as you were saying, an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. You clicked to the picture of uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal, and I have heard she is an absolute piece of work to work with. So it was just perfect for immovable object. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But um, th that's, that's kind of off track. In any case, it is my favorite of his films because in addition to it being so great at, to me, making the perfect translation of a live-action film that you can take seriously that uses a property... Um, that was previously thought as, oh, that's that's childish, that's kiddish, being he superhero properties. And although you can make an argument that films like Spider-Man by Sam Raimi and X-Men in a few years before um, kind of set the stage for taking superhero films seriously, this to me was the switch, be you know, the on-off switch of we're taking this seriously now. This is a real artistic field that can be cultivated that led to things like Logan that led to things like um well um I, I guess controversially to some people Batman vs Superman <laughs> later um <laughs> same but, writer by the way right but um you know it it was the pinnacle um and will go down I think ultimately as a classic of the age of which it was written and also some of the things that Tyler doesn't even like about it. I'm convinced that they were intentionally placed there as, um, you know, kind of important messages of the zeitgeist of the time um, being, you know, kind of inherently politically important and culturally important. And um, obviously lots of people have included talks about the Patriot Act being... Um, you know, comparable to how Batman ultimately tracks down and defeats the Joker um, and how he does the right thing to give that up once he's done. But I think um, a, a one of the things that was incredibly powerful to me and subverted expectations... Um, well, first of all, let me just say real quick. To me, the whole film, start to finish, is the only film I've ever seen that I can literally say felt perfect. Like, so it's like, your favorite movie? Like every film, uh, other film that I've seen, there, there have been some really great ones, but there have been, there's been there been at least a millisecond where it's like, I check out. For some reason, I just have an itch. I have to use the bathroom. I'm tired, whatever. This is the only film that literally felt to me like this was perfect. 
I one of the reasons I was put on this earth is to see this movie. <laughs> and um, it, it, it's also, I think, special to me because, um, you know, it came out literally on my birthday that year. <laughs> and so it, it it felt like it had a deep meaning, um, personally, even though that's completely superficial in the grand scheme of things. But also the ending message that kind of disappointed Tyler um, and he felt was anticlimactic um, about Batman taking the blame... I think it was an interesting mirrored image of kind of U.S. imperialism um, that was so important of the times, similar to, um, obviously, there's been talks of um, the Batman series dealing with the problem of terrorism, especially Nolan's Batman series. Um, And this one, what made it so potent about him saying, you can blame me, was the basically the government um instigating in hindsight a lie you know that basically there were people on the inside that knew for all intensive purposes that they were leading a propaganda tour in order to um get in an area so that they could exert power and wealth from an area just to continue the imperial conquest and um so to see that um, kind of the Batman almost accepting the villainy of the time period in which so many people like myself were enraged was a very interesting metaphor for um, the, the problems that were being caused by um, some of the good qualities that Batman intends, but the Joker kind of exposes flaws in his ideology. Um, So although it wasn't, it proves he's not a perfect character, it to me shows a perfect film and a perfect character arc that really could have ended there um, for what it was. Okay, I wanted to mention one last thing about, um, you know, Two-Face in the movie, which is a great villain, by the way, that they did in it. And I love the effects that they did for his reveal. True. And I heard from people when they saw that, people kind of freaked out. And it was kind of like our generation's kind of Frankenstein monster reveal moment, where back then, the Depression, when they saw the Frankenstein monster for the first time, a lot of audience members got scared of that. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like our kind of reveal in a way, but my question I was asking a little bit earlier, um, you didn't answer it. Is this your favorite movie of all time then? I, there have been so many films I've seen at this point that it's a little hard for me to say for certain, but I, my default assumption off the top of my head is absolutely. Okay. And um, if not, it is in the top three period, um, you know, of, of all time. To me, it is absolutely the best film of the past 20 years okay um but that yeah go ahead okay well i've got a batman movie that i think is uh slightly better than this one and it's at my number two pick and that is batman begins batman begins is also kind of special to me like steven in a way because this movie also came out on my birthday too Mm -hmm. (laughs) like uh dark knights was kind of funny in a way I like about this movie a lot is that it was very meta for the Batman franchise, the whole metaphor, oh, the whole like saying of why we fall Bruce so we can pick ourselves back up. This was very tr- relevant at the time because this was the Batman franchise coming back eight years later after the camp fest of Batman Robin with the ice puns of that credit card and the nipples and yep. that. This was like a 180 for the best, even though it did divert from the source material in the comics. I felt like this everything they did was necessary for it. And again, it does tie in, like I guess you can kind of say, of the times, as you were mentioning before, with like terrorism and the League of Shadows being like this radical ideologist group from like you know another country in the East. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I thought it was a. I love the soundtrack throughout the, all the movies by Hans Zimmer. But I also like this one a good amount, too. It felt very like you're going up with uh, Batman, his journey. You really do feel that emotional struggle that he's going with to overcome his fear. Because if you look at the Nolan Batman movies, the theme of Batman Begins is Batman overcoming fear. In The Dark Knight, is him overcoming, you know, terrorism. 
and anarchy and chaos. And then the third movie, it's pain he's trying to overcome in The Dark Knight Rises. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I do think that in this movie, I really like a lot what they did with it. It had a lot of villains, too. I feel like one issue I do have with the movie is kind of the whole, like, um quick cuts during the fight scenes when it came to editing could have been a bit confusing but True. i love that when he escapes arkham asylum and the whole chase scene was pretty fun and i don't get why people really didn't like uh not maggie gyllenhaal but um i just i forgot her name again <laughs> um like, sorry um what was her name i just oh, forgot uh not rachel um that's the character oh, oh, i'm God. so bad right now <laughs> yeah you know who we're talking about uh, Rachel and Batman Begins. Katie Holmes. Katie, Katie Holmes. Holmes. Yes. Yeah. I don't understand why people thought her acting was bad, and I know at the very least she was nominated for a Razzie for Worst Actress, which I don't get, like, why it wasn't that bad, necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, kind of the weakest compared to the other big heavyweight actors in the movie, but I wouldn't say she was really that bad in the movie, but overall this is easily one of my favorite Batman movies. There's only about a few I can think are better than this one. Personally, I think Batman Mask of the Phantasm is the best Batman movie of all time. But anyway, let uh, Steven give his two cents on this. Yeah, um, actually, we, we just saw this again tonight to uh, commemorate this special occasion, and um, to me it stands as my number three. Um, it definitely is in the middle of the Batman films, and one of his stronger films um, overall, but definitely a couple steps down from The Dark Knight. To me, The Dark Knight definitely um, took the criticisms of Batman Begins and built off of them for a perfect conclusion, but again, we're not talking about The Dark Knight right now, we're talking about Batman Begins. And to me, it was a great, um, talking earlier about The Dark Knight Rises having, um, to me, a bit more of an interesting villain than Ra's al Ghul. I still found Ra's al Ghul very interesting. And by the way, uh, Marvel, if you're listening, Ra's al Ghul is how you do the Mandarin right. Oh, yeah. The, the Mandarin <laughs> twist, where, where it just turns out, you know... Ra ha ha! I am the Mandarin. All of a sudden, no, no, that is cringe. That is terrible. This is how you do the surprise twist. And it's kind of similar in Dark Knight Rises when you know how in Iron Man three it's like Pepper Potts defeats the villain, right? And they can't do that in Dark Knight Rises with uh, Catwoman defeating Bane. True. I mean, it would have been like the same cringy equivalent would have been if Alfred defeated Bane. Oh, but... <laughs> that would have been awful. But in any case, um, to me and. and I would assume to Tyler as well, um, the, the star of this film is Batman. And um, this is his strongest film in terms of character development, understanding him, making him, for the other films as well, a relatable character that we are invested in more than, honestly, maybe any of the live-action Batmans at the very least. Michael Keaton, th th there are some people I've met that... I view him as an exception, but to me, it's hands down Nolan um, for the live action series. The, obviously, you know Kevin Conroy and um, mm -hmm. Mark Hamill for the animated are um, a different league as well. But um, Batman Begins proves um, and set the way for um, the gritty realism noir films. Um, and not even just noir, but just gritty realism that uh, came to define a lot of some of the best works of film, and especially in the blockbuster genre of the 2000s. And it also made reboots popular, by the way. It sure did. It sure did. Yeah, I mean, one last thing I'll say about the movie. One Another thing I prefer about this movie over the later Batman movies is that Batman didn't have his infamous smoker voice. <sighs> He did for a couple parts, but well, when he was general, interrogating, yes. when he was interrogating people, right? I feel like he could have ditched the smoker voice when he was uh, trying to convince Harvey Dent to put the gun down, mm -hmm. in that sort of deal. But then again, they might have been like fear of plagiarizing Batman Returns ending when he takes his mask off, right? Listening to Kyle. But anyway, so for my number one favorite Christopher Nolan movie is Inception. Now, mm. Inception. Is a great movie. It's easily one of my favorite movies of the 2010s. It was my second. It's my second favorite movie of that decade, just below Silver Lines Playbook. But Inception. I don't really have to explain this one since it's such an iconic movie. Everyone's 
been like kind of spoofing it and also the soundtrack to the movie has been so influential when it comes to movie trailer music Mm -hmm. and again i do like i mean the length i think is the only issue i do have with the movie but i do love the themes about like oh the dream world but at the same time it shows the emotions of this guy he's kind of stuck in his own dream in a way because of the trauma he experienced with his wife who wasn't so sure if they were out of the dream or not and i love the hallway sequence how how that was like uh when it's like turning around that was a miniature set they built and that was pretty awesome too and i do think um what was her name in the movie ellen page i think i think mm-hmm. she was kind of the weakest character sure. in the movie despite her kind of feeling like the audience and this is yeah. the one that i felt like one of the few christopher nolan movies i realized relied the most heavy on computer effects which does make sense in a way keeping you know it's all the dream world and that but yeah i love the um this music in the movie too how the Hans zimmer like time song is easily one of his favorites that he's one of the best he's made and Mm -hmm. again this is a movie that's going to be well by the time we release this video it'll be 10 years old but i definitely plan on watching it um when it turns 10 years old and it was the first movie i actually saw in theaters by myself so Mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting in that respect so anyway uh, take it away steven yeah um i for me just to get it out of the way I am in close agreement with you. Inception is my number two. Uh, to me, it is definitely the best of Christopher Nolan's um, original concepts that he turned into a film. And I completely agree. I work at a radio station. I do a lot of voiceover. I do a lot of music stuff. Um, so basically, to me, um, the Inception soundtrack it has clearly shown a huge influence over trailer music. Um, the acceptance of scores uh, publicly is, you know, an acceptable thing to listen to and not being just an orchestra nerd. (laughs) Um, And the performances overall in it were very strong. I do agree with you that Ellen Page was the weakest, and basically she was there to be, hi, my name is Mrs. Audience. Could you please (laughs) exposition for me? Uh, And that was her purpose. Um... The film, to me, the first time, I I actually had to watch it two or three times to fully absorb what was happening, but I remember the first time I watched the film, um, it, the, there was a scene that was so powerful in it that it made me tear up a bit. And that was the one with, basically, the, the, in the dream, with the dad, um, talking about, you know, disappointed that you tried. Um... And there had been something personal in my life that um, basically someone had been close to passing away um, that was very dear to me that was a sort of father figure, not my actual father. So that really hit close to home for me. And But in general, like beyond just the writing of this and how amazingly complex the story was, from a technical perspective, this was pretty inarguably his most technically impressive film um doing a fantastic job combining the um the full beauty of practical effects and uh top-notch cg work that sets him apart as one of the truly great directors of our time and um the sets the score the performances and the story that was built and also, I truly think that Inception is um, so good because it is an experiment and a um, a trip into Christopher Nolan's mind palace. You know, <laughs> a, a autopsy of the inner mechanisms of his mind that truly lets the audience understand how deep he can go with um, concepts and um, bring you back to the other side, um, which is really powerful. And um, so to me, it stands as definitely um, in probably the top five of um, films of, gosh, maybe the past 20 years, but definitely that decade. Um, And it is a classic for sure. Oh yeah. So, yeah, and I definitely agree with that. And yeah, I mean, there's definitely moments where, yeah, the time 
um, soundtrack moment from that movie is definitely very emotional and easily one of Hans Zimmer's best, if not his best piece of work. Mm -hmm. So anyway, hope you enjoyed our top 10 video list or maybe make in the comments section what you would rank the Christopher Nolan movies at the moment. But anyway, this is Tyler from Anchor Reviews. And Stephen from Stephen Lawson Studios. Yes, we hope you enjoyed this episode of After the Credits on Anchor Reviews. And we hope to make a lot more in the future. Please like and subscribe.